Good morning, or as my German friends say, Guten Morgen. Welcome to Making Stuff with Chris Dehut. Today we're going to talk about uh, matrix keypads, uh, this sort of device. If you've been looking at different electronics over the years, uh, either finished components, manufactured components, or electronic components, no doubt you've seen these keypads. So today we're going to learn about how to interface that with the Raspberry Pi Pico. And what we're going to cover will be what they're used for, relatively obvious, uh, applications, uh, perhaps not so obvious, but truly is. Uh, then we're going to take a look at a data sheet example of these matrix keypads so that you understand that they're not all the same and you have to pay attention to the wiring internal to them. Uh, finally, we're going to look at a full breadboard example that we're using here for our example, and then we're going to go over a program that utilizes both threading and, uh, for lack of a better word, buffering so that we don't get uh, key repeats, which can be quite a nuisance with microcontrollers because you don't have that visual feedback. Matrix keypads come in a variety of sizes. This happens to be a 16 button, typical layout. You can get different layouts, uh, different configurations. Uh, 12 button are very common, kind of like a telephone. Um, uh, more buttons, less buttons, they can be a single strip, etc. Uh, but this is a very popular style that's used in many projects that us makers uh, work with. They work relatively simply. Um, this particular style is a membrane style, so it's wonderfully easy uh, to use with any of our projects. It's very thin, it's adhesive backed, and here on our prototype unit I have attached mine uh, that I work with on my bench here to an aluminum plate so that it's always convenient to use and it doesn't scoot around while I'm uh, pressing the buttons. The operation of them is rather simple. There are four wires here that are connected to each row. So perhaps, or for example, this outer wire in the ribbon cable might be connected to this row all the way across. Second wire, this row, and so on. Then there are four wires on this side that are connected to each column. So the left one might be this column, the second one this column, and so on. And the way these operate is this, and it's truly very simple. We apply a voltage to this row, and then we look at this column, and then this column, then this column, and then this column. If any one of those are high, when we look at it as an input, we know that button is being pressed. So we'll do row one, look at column one, two, three, four. Then I'm going to look at column B, or row B, across this way. Look at column one, two, three, four, and then repeat that all the way through for as many uh, different numbers of keys in the matrix. And from that, we can minimize the number of keys that are required to implement a keypad. If we were to just wire or put one input on each button, my microcontroller would require at least 17 or 16 uh, GP input pins. By breaking it up with this scanning technique, we reduce that by half. So I only really need 8 GP pins. And that works out pretty nice for our Raspberry Pi Pico. On one of them that I have, I peeled off the backing so that we could see what's inside. So let's take a quick look at how this is all wired together. As you can see, one of the ribbon cable conductors goes along each row. And then on the opposite side of the ribbon cable, uh, we'll have one conductor for each column going all the way across. Truly very simple. Now normally I talk a lot about uh, applications for some of the gadgets and gizmos that we interface with different microcontrollers, or in this case the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, but in the case of a digital keypad, it's akin to describing the applications for a normal computer keyboard 
on a regular PC or a Mac. It's just very universal. Uh, it doesn't matter the application that you're using your microcontroller for. It's more the application of any time your microcontroller needs input or data input, you would use a keypad. And these are a very economical choice to provide input into a microcontroller. These units are less than $2 each when bought in quantity of five, uh, and I'll have a link for that below uh, for Amazon where you can purchase them. They're very economical, very easy to use, uh, and so on. So they are an ideal choice for data input on microcontrollers. And they work very easily, of course, with MicroPython here on the Pico. The data sheet I'm going to reference for this is from uh, Components 101. It's uh, just a random website that popped up when I was searching for a data sheet. Uh, but as you can see, it's very much like the one that we've got now. Uh, same uh, number of keys, 16 keys, and it is the same uh, configuration with characters on it. Uh, the very first thing you want to understand with a matrix keypad uh, regarding the data sheet is the wiring. Uh, which pins are the columns? Which pins are the rows? If you can't find a data sheet specifically for yours, uh, start out with our example that we've got here or just find a random uh, wiring diagram and give that a try. If the keys don't come up right, you'll know that your uh, row count or your column count is either different meaning it's going, uh, say, from bottom up as opposed to top down for one through four. Or the uh, column pins could be on the right instead of the left, that sort of thing. Sometimes uh, with these economical uh, devices, you got to get creative uh, to get the information you need. Now up here, uh, we're showing the rows and the columns of which pin is which. Uh, here they're defining uh, which one is uh, doing what. Um, this shows how internally the wiring is. Uh, we already uh, discussed that a little bit earlier when we were talking about what it is. How uh, you've got four rows that are all connected uh, across to all the columns. And then four columns that uh, reach all the way from row one to row four. And it is that matrix that allows us to pick and choose or to uh, scan each individual button very easily. Uh, maximum voltage, maximum current, always important to look at in a data sheet. Uh, in this case, it's looking at 24 volts max, 30 milliamps max. And in truth, that's way, way more than we should ever use on a keypad, uh, especially on a Pico where we're working with 3.3 volts. So. Uh, we're well within the operating uh, capability of this particular unit. And then they provide some other uh, attributes and details about features. I do want to show you one more thing here so that you get a handle on a, a way to visualize how this will work in, in code. Now in code, uh, we're going to scan or power the rows in our program. And we're using 3.3 volts. This says plus 5 volts. It's irrelevant. Uh, uh, for the Raspberry Pi Pico, it's a 3.3 volt device. Now in our code, we're going to power up row 1 and then look at each column, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if any of those switches are made, the input will be high. Now if we look at this first row, if I powered that, all the switches are open, so all of my uh, column inputs would be low. If we jump down to row three here, uh, I power that up in my code, I turn on that output, and then I'm gonna scan my columns one by one. I'm gonna look at column one, it's low. Column two, uh oh, that's high. Because column two is high, I know the button is pressed as shown here. And thus current and voltage will flow through there into column two. So when I look at that one, if it's high, I know that button is pressed. That's essentially how all these matrix keyboards and keypads operate. 
Uh, here they're showing uh, powering it the opposite way, powering the columns and reading the rows. Uh, again, it's irrelevant. It's ever, whichever way you want to go. No advantages, etc. Now let's take a look at this on the Fritzing diagram. I'll zoom out here a little bit so we can get a, a look. Oops. That is the whole wiring diagram in a nutshell. We've got four rows, one, two, three, four, four columns, one, two, three, four. And because of that, I've got eight wires going from the keypad back to our Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, this connector here is a wonderful connector that will work with either headers on a breadboard or a circuit board or DuPont connector wires or jumper wires. Uh, the important part here is, uh, well first, just point out that uh, purple, gray, white, and black are the right four conductors coming out of the keypad, and then blue, green, yellow, and orange are coming out of the four left conductors. And of course this isn't always true. You have to kind of check this sometimes, or at least try it and see how it works. All right, now up here on the Pico, from GP11, 10, 9, and 8, we're powering our rows. We'll be configuring these as outputs. And then GP pin 15, 14, 13, and 12 will be inputs. And we'll configure those as such. And then we'll be looking for information on those and then sending out uh, voltage and current on these. So the wiring is very, very simple. The uh, nice thing about uh, these is they're so breadboard friendly, circuit board friendly, and uh, project friendly that they're just hard to pass up. Now let's take a look at this on the actual uh, circuit board, or on our breadboard, so you see the exact similarities there. Here's our Pi Pico. The wires, uh, in my case, the ribbon that I've got, the DuPont ribbon, uh, it's male on both ends, so I can plug this end directly into the breadboard. This end goes directly into the connector provided by, uh, or included on the keypad. And they're the exact same colors. Uh, imagine that, how that magically happened between the fritzing diagram and my DuPont cable here. Uh, but this is plugged together just exactly as it is on the fritzing diagram. It's really quite simple to work with. Now we're going to turn our attention to looking at the program and how all this operates. The first thing we'll do is demonstrate it so that you see how it behaves and then we'll go through an explanation of how everything works together. So I'm going to go ahead and run it here. Currently running, nothing's happening because no buttons are pressed. So I'll press the button 1 and we get key code number 1. And that's being printed in my main loop right here print key code equals whatever key code came from our routine. Uh, but if I press and hold, as I am now on key 5, nothing happens. I let go of it, nothing happens. Uh, so it will not auto-repeat. And that's uh, intentional. On microcontrollers, often we don't have good visual feedback or even audible feedback that a button is being pressed and so forth. So key repeats can introduce a lot of problems. Here we're forcing the user to intentionally press the button multiple times to get a repeat as opposed to possibly blindly a whole bunch of number data is going into the microcontroller overloading it or providing some very false information. Uh, so let's go through uh, what we've got in our code here. Um, up here is a fairly good explanation of the whole process uh, of what's happening here. And the important thing uh, that we want to understand right away uh, is that this is going to be done in a separate thread. Now the Raspberry Pi Pico has two cores and uh, the microcontroller is very capable of doing threading, meaning multitasking. Another uh, operation can be running over here and over here is a different operation. We can get two of those to happen at the same time, one in each core, uh, without a whole lot of trouble. And of course MicroPython makes that brilliantly easy for us. Um, so as going back down to the main loop, you'll see that all I'm really doing is looking at a variable, 
to see if it is equal or not equal to null. And then if it's not, uh, then I would uh, capture that key code. And then I would reset user key to null and then print it. I'm not looking at the actual buttons or anything in this part of my program. So in my main loop, it's actually very clean, very simple. Uh, there's not a lot of clutter in there because that's where you're going to put the bulk of your code to do the bulk of your work. All your data processing and output goes on in generally in your main loop. Now we'll go back to the top here and I'll read through this uh, discussion or description here with you um, is so that you understand conceptually how the whole program will work. Uh, I'm saying this is a matrix keypad digital, meaning it's using discrete input or output discrete on or off. It's threaded, the program module's threaded, meaning we're running in a thread and we're using buffering to remove key repeats. And that's nothing more than uh, setting data in a variable, checking that variable, and then resetting it before the next key can be uh, processed. Uh, the thread handles the keyboard scanning, uh, leaving the main loop to handle other tasks, just as I described. When a key is pressed, the value is written to a global variable user key. The thread uh, that's doing all the key processing stops checking for key presses until user key is processed in the main loop and the button is re released. So that gets rid of uh, repeat keys uh, where you press the button and it continually repeats and it also forces us uh, to process every single input in our program before we allow more input to occur. And then finally, that's the last statement. The main loop must process user key and then set it to null before we can do any more data processing. As with most MicroPython programs, we're going to import a few libraries. In this case, the machine library, which gives us access to the pins and the ability to control them. Uh, the MicroPython uh, version of time and then we're going to import the thread module and that's how we can do this multitasking. We're going to configure our row uh, pins or our row objects here that are connected to the pins uh, 15 through 12 as we discussed earlier we're going to configure those as outputs. Columns 1 through 4 are going to be connected to pins 11 through 8. Those will be configured as inputs and we're going to use a pull down resistor to hold that input at zero volts instead of floating. This is that variable we're going to use to pass information from uh, the thread, the function within the thread, back out to the main program, user key. And we're going to set that to null, meaning empty. I prefer to use uh, an actual word because it just helps me keep things clear in code and in my head. Uh, now we'll jump past this function down here where we start the thread. Uh, in MicroPython, this is how we would start our new thread. And in this case, I'm calling it Keyboard Scanner. So this statement here is all that's really needed to start this thread running. And here's where Keyboard Scanner is. So it's nothing more, it looks nothing more than a traditional function uh, that's being run, called and run by the threading uh, system. Here is uh, the assignment, or we're saying that that user key variable is global, so I can write to it and then read to it, read from it back in the main uh, program. I've got another variable here called lock, and what I want to do. Uh, in this loop here, if I want to prevent this loop from processing a key, I want to lock it. So I would change lock to locked. Uh, but while I want it to have access to processing keys, I will set that to unlocked. Thus our initial state as we come into this function. And that is going to be used to compare against what we do with data in this loop. Now this loop within the function runs constantly, it never stops, 
At the very end of it down here, I've got a regulator. Uh, U time dot sleep, uh, 20 milliseconds. No need for it to run full speed, and it works very well uh, response wise at 20 milliseconds. Feel free to modify it if you feel, feel it's needed. Uh, now at this point here, um, what I'm going to do, and you'll see that this code looks exactly like this code, and this code, and this code. Those are four blocks of code that process each of the rows one by one. So this code block right here, we set row one the value of row one high, meaning turn the power on, and then it's off on all other three other rows. Then, one by one, I'm going to look at each column. One, two, three, four. And I'm going to see if that is high or true. If it is, then I'm going to assign a value to key pressed. And that value here is the actual uh, value that is on the keypad's uh, faceplate. So if I press 1, then I, I know if I press 1, it's on row 1, column 1, and that would be key code number 1. And then we repeat that for the other four rows. And you'll see row 1, row uh, 2 is being powered, row 3, and finally row 4. So realistically, all this code is the same, and all it's doing is just powering up that row and checking to see if a switch is pressed. Uh, and that's what is described up in this area. Now we get down to here, and this is where the, the real uh, work is done. We've got two conditional statements. Uh, first, we'll look at this one, uh, because this sets a stage for this one to do some action. So we'll go down here and we're going to say uh, uh, if lock equals unlocked, meaning if, it, uh, if currently we are not locked up here and the key pressed is not equal to null, meaning it contains some value. Here's key pressed. Uh, we might have set it, set it to the, the letter D. So we have to be unlocked and a key pressed in order to perform this action. We're going to set the lock to locked, meaning we can't do any more actions anywhere in here. And then we're going to set user key to the key that was pressed, that we tested here, and then copied to here. Now, at this point, in the main program, it could see if user key is not equal to null, because now it's equal to key pressed, we will then uh, copy into key code, a local variable in our main loop. We'll copy that value into there. We will set user key uh, back to null, and then we'll print out down below here, as I'll show right here. And I'm pressing C. That is the behavior up in here, uh, what this part does. But what we're preventing by doing this double step or this double test like this is so that we don't get key repeats and we're also forcing that this test perform action on every key press. So this will all stay locked until we get through this loop again at the top key pressed equals no. Now if the user is relatively slow with button presses, as soon as it comes back through the loop again, there will be probably the same button press, D. Well, I don't want to act on it again, uh, so uh, we'll look here, is lock equal to locked? And is uh, the key pressed equal to no? Well, it's definitely not. It doesn't pass that test. Um, but here, uh, lock isn't unlocked yet. It's currently locked. I haven't unlocked it. So this gets ignored and that'll keep happening until the user finally lets go of the button. Now keep in mind this whole loop is probably happening uh, thousands of times a second so it's very easy to get repeats. But uh, to get it unlocked we need to uh, look at a couple of conditions. If locked, the variable is locked 
meaning it was processing, this routine was processing a key press, and key pressed equals null, that key is no longer being pressed, we will change the value of lock to unlocked. And then that would allow this code to process the next key press. It's really very simple if you take your time and just read through it uh, and then uh, run the code a couple times. So we'll run that again. Uh, and it should be uh, fairly clear. Um, pressing and holding the number five, not repeating, let go of number five, no further action. I can go to uh, the letter A key, press it once, let go, uh, very fast, let go. I can press it as many times as I want in a row, and we keep getting repeats. Now I'm moving B. So this routine, seemingly very complex, but in truth very simple, with just a couple of conditional statements that are a little tricky to get your head around, but work very reliably, uh, so that it ensures that we process every key press and that we don't get uh, unlimited or really fast key repeats. Hopefully this video and the information provided in it will get you one step closer to being comfortable with uh, experimenting with and using matrix keypads. They're a wonderful accessory to use with microcontrollers uh, due to their ability to allow for uh, very easy data input into your program. I would like to point out that the source code for this program and the Fitzing diagram are located on our companion website, makingstuffwithchrisdayhut.com, and the link directly to those download files will be in the description area down below. Also, I'd like to mention that if some of these concepts are uh, new to you, such as the machine uh, library, working with pins, uh, threading, uh, and a variety of other things, uh, there are, uh, will be, by the end of the series, somewhere between 50 and 60, potentially even more, videos covering the Raspberry Pi Pico, MicroPython, and a lot of uh, the subjects will be on interfacing various components, as well as your uh, general tutorial videos talking about certain aspects and features uh, within MicroPython programming. So please be sure to check out our website, look at the index of videos, and of course the YouTube channel. With that, I'd like to express my appreciation for you spending time with me today to go over uh, these uh, matrix keypads. Uh, they're just wonderful things. If you enjoyed the video, and uh, if you would like to, I would it would help me greatly if you would subscribe and give me a like. Uh, if you want to be notified of future videos, uh, there's a notification bell up above. If you click that, you'll be notified when new videos are released. So again, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.